Hey everyone, Chris here. So if you're a member of the D&D community, you've probably recently been hearing the name Kyle Brink all of a sudden. So Kyle Brink is the executive producer of Dungeons & Dragons, and it's safe to say that before January 18th of this year, most of us had never heard of him. Recently though, he's been the face of D&D, doing damage control after the OGL 1.1 debacle. He's the one who proposed the survey, he announced that OGL 1.0a wouldn't be deauthorized, that the SRD 5.1 had been published under Creative Commons, and lately he's been doing interviews with content creators to answer questions on behalf of Wizards of the Coast. Now, if you want to know what he said in these interviews, you have hours of content to watch. If you want to watch these interviews in their entirety, I'm going to link them down below. I've watched them all in their entirety and have been taking notes so I could give you a more condensed recap. I'm going to start with a brief timeline of events that led to these interviews. So in mid-November of last year, a rumor that Wizards of the Coast may be planning to ban the publication of third-party homebrew content surfaced. This was followed up on November 22nd with a statement from Wizards of the Coast that third-party publishers would be able to publish content for D&D moving forward, but the OGL would, quote, continue to evolve, which was regarded with suspicion since the OGL hadn't changed for over a decade. Then a couple weeks later, Cynthia Williams, the CEO of Wizards of the Coast, made a huge public relations nightmare for Wizards of the Coast by calling D&D under-monetized in a publicly available conference call with investors. In social media, the D&D community speculate what she meant. D&D would no longer have printed books. The Wizards of the Coast virtual tabletop in development would be the only way to play D&D. Content would be hidden behind paywalls through endless microtransactions and loot boxes. The community was watching carefully for evidence that Wizards was up to no good. Things continued to spiral in December when on December 16th, it became public that Wizards of the Coast had been sending emails to third-party content creators offering them information about the updated OGL, but requiring signing a non-disclosure agreement. Social media speculation continued that Wizards of the Coast was not going to allow third-party publishers to create content for D&D with the one D&D edition. This was the point where the hashtag OpenD&D started as social media influencers asked the general community to speak out. Five days later, Wizards of the Coast published an unsigned article on D&D Beyond to address the rumors. They said there would be a new OGL that would include income reporting and royalties on income, but it would affect fewer than 20 creators. And for most creators, quote, relatively little will change. On January 5th, a Gizmodo article was released where journalist Linda Kodega revealed they had been leaked a copy of OGL 1.1 and revealed that this license contained a clause that provided Wizards of the Coast an irrevocable, royalty-free license for any content published under the OGL. Royalty rates were going to be 25%. The OGL 1.0a would be deauthorized, and the entire OGL would be terminated with 30 days notice by Wizards of the Coast. On social media, the D&D community was informed that this OGL 1.1 was sent to third-party publishers requiring their signature before January 16th. Failing to sign this contract meant they wouldn't be able to publish content for D&D at all. Now the community was outraged and vocal. This license was blatantly unfair and being forced down the throats of content creators. We were informed on social media that Wizards of the Coast employees had secretly leaked information that Wizards of the Coast was watching D&D Beyond subscriptions to measure whether the OGL 1.1 could go ahead as written. As a result, screenshots of D&D Beyond subscriptions being cancelled became very popular. The community was in an uproar and Wizards of the Coast wasn't saying anything publicly. Five days passed before they responded with a tweet that said, basically thanking us for being patient, which we weren't, and saying they would say something soon. Three more days passed when we got our first response from Wizards of the Coast. This was the infamous, they won and so did we, response. They claimed that the OGL 1.1 was a draft, and based on feedback, they were drafting a new license with no royalty structure, and the clause that would essentially provide Wizards of the Coast the ability to steal the work of third-party content creators was going to be scrapped. We were informed on social media, they were lying. The OGL 1.1 was going to be pushed through as is, but Wizards of the Coast was waiting until the outrage from the community died down to do it. The Tone Deaf article was also criticized for not being signed by the person who wrote it. The intention of the article was likely to calm down the community, but it had the opposite effect. Social media continued to reveal the plans of Wizards of the Coast. D&D Beyond was going to require a $30 per month subscription fee. Homebrew was no longer going to be allowed on D&D Beyond. 
Wizards was developing AI technology to replace DMs, and the management of Wizards of the Coast hated D&D players, etc. The D&D community began to fight with itself. Some players vowed to leave D&D, and there was strong pressure being placed on D&D players to switch to other games. This was the peak of the outrage and anger in the community. On January 18th, many of us heard the name Kyle Brink for the first time. He released a letter on D&D Beyond that was the beginning of the end of the D&D OGL debacle. This was a much better thought out response than the previous article. He introduced himself. He made a succinct apology. He acknowledged the OGL 1.1 was disruptive to creators. He acknowledged they had been communicating poorly. He then proposed a solution. He would provide a copy of the next OGL draft, OGL 1.2. Anyone who wanted to could read it and then provide his team feedback on what they liked and what they didn't like through surveys. He promised that they would use the feedback to fix what we didn't like, potentially going back and forth multiple times until everyone was satisfied. One day later, a second letter was published that released the OGL 1.2 draft and explained some of the changes from OGL 1.1. The royalties would be gone. The financial reporting would be gone. The clause that granted themselves the irrevocable royalty-free license to use your work would be gone. The core mechanics of the rules would be released under a Creative Commons license. A link to the survey was given, and we were told it would remain open until February 3rd and that he would share results and actions they would take by February 17th. He promised they would listen to our feedback and get it right. Now, to say these responses were met with suspicion online in social media would be an understatement. Referring to the OGL 1.1 as a draft meant he was a liar. The survey was just a way to shut up the community. It was a delay tactic. It was a way to trick people back to the D&D Beyond website. Survey responses were not going to be read. They were going to do what they wanted anyways. We were assured from leaks from Wizards of the Coast employees that the Wizards of the Coast strategy made leaving the OGL 1.0a in place was impossible. Hundreds of millions of dollars were at stake. I don't know how many members of the community were successfully discouraged from filling in the survey, but I filled in mine, and apparently they had over 15,000 surveys completed in the first 10 days. On January 27th, Kyle Brink released another article. This was one week before the survey was supposed to close, and one month before we were told we would get survey results. He told us that the survey results had made the situation crystal clear to them. 89% of survey respondents were dissatisfied with deauthorizing the OGL 1.0a. 86% were dissatisfied with the draft VTT policy. 62% were satisfied with including SRD content under Creative Commons, and most of the 38% that were dissatisfied made comments that more SRD content should be under Creative Commons. He said the results were so clear they were closing the survey immediately. They weren't deauthorizing the OGL 1.0a, and the entire 5th edition SRD had been published under Creative Commons license, and he gave a link so we could see for ourselves that it had already been done. The community expressed universal shock through social media. Wizard of the Coast had taken the survey responses and provided us everything that we had asked for in those surveys, and much sooner than they had promised to provide anything at all. I'm not aware of a single social media influencer who wasn't surprised by this turn of events. This did not fit the information that we were being given at all. We were pleased, but this didn't make any sense. So the conclusion was drawn that I guess what it means is they can give up on the earlier editions of D&D, but one D&D will have a restrictive license. They will create, and I've heard this phrase many times in recent days, a walled garden for one D&D so you sure you can publish for previous editions, but if you want to be involved in 1D&D, you're going to have to sign our new restrictive license. Shortly afterwards, various content creators and influencers were contacted by Wizards of the Coast, offering a chance to speak with Kyle Brink and ask any questions they had. A number of these conversations have been released publicly, and I have gone through them all. I've taken notes, recorded clips, and what I want to present is the information that we've gotten. There's a lot of redundancy in these interviews, so, just so you know, some of the things Kyle Brink says here have been repeated multiple times elsewhere. Now, I don't know Kyle Brink, so I can't speak to his integrity. You're going to have to make up your own minds. I can say watching the videos, he struck me as honest but careful. By that I mean there was encouragement for him to address some of the accusations regarding Chris Kao, and he didn't confirm or deny any of it. 
He just skirted around those questions. As far as for what information he has given, for now, I'm going to take it at face value. If he hasn't been truthful, that will be eventually revealed. And if so, he is committing career suicide. My assumption would be he wouldn't want to do that. So let's get into some clips. Now I'm going to start with a clip that I honestly shouldn't have to present, but the outrage machine is still going. So despite the fact that Wizards of the Coast ended up doing the right thing, it was maybe too late for a lot of people. So they're still looking for reasons to be outraged at Wizards of the Coast. And what I'm seeing is some clips from these interviews being misrepresented or placed out of context in order to keep that outrage machine going. So I, I want to correct the record on the one that I think I've heard the most. And that is that Kyle Brink figures that white men can't leave this hobby fast enough. This isn't true. So I'm going to show you what was actually said in context. I've met a number of people who, including yourself, who are fairly high up in D&D. &D, uh, and I think every single one of them has been white. And also, I think all of them have been cis men, not to say that everybody there is a cis man, but it seems to be consistently that we have white cis men still at the top of these yeah. groups. Can you identify any specific positions of like significant power? Because um, you got you got I mean, even on the D&D &D team, you still got uh, you've still got Jeremy Crawford. Uh, you still got uh, Mike Merles and so forth. What can you identify any specific uh positions that have like higher ranking positions that have been filled by people of say racially diverse backgrounds he is asked to list the people in the upper management of D, D who aren't white cis men and it's clear from his answer that's not a big list right now so instead what he's going to talk about is how things are changing and how we could expect more diverse people in management as time progresses uh, I think if you look at the the credits of our books, um, you'll see some lead designers there who are are uh, not cis men. Uh, you will also see a lot of uh, primary authors on sources. Uh, these are folks who are coming up through the ranks and proving themselves and uh, earning their respect, not because of who they are, but because of how they are as professionals, uh, which is the best kind of respect, right? You, know, you don't want to be respected because you're the diversity hire. You want to be respected because you're awesome at your job. Uh, and that's uh, and that's happening more and more. Um, this you know, look, guys like me, we're we're leaving uh, the workforce, to be blunt. And we're also not. This is not the face of the hobby anymore. I'm not the majority of this hobby anymore. Uh, and I, I and so it's important to me that my team of creators look like my players and have the lived experience that my players do. Uh, and I think there's been mistakes made in years past where people assumed that D&D players were all, you know, white dudes in a basement, um, which is which has been a faulty assumption for a lot of years and gets more and more false every day. So what I take from what he's saying here is that he's saying, yeah, it's true. Of we're mostly white men up in the upper management um, and mostly older white men in the upper management. And that probably never was proper representation of the d, &D community, but we have more diverse creators who are coming up through the ranks and things are going to change. Uh, and so it's, in my viewpoint, honestly, guys like me can't, can't leave soon enough. So if you see that quote in YouTube videos or articles, now you know what the full context is. All right, now that that's out of the way, I guess the first questions are, who is Kyle Brink? What does he do in Wizards of the Coast? Does he even play D&D? How did you get started with D&D? Uh, as a I, DM or player? I learned D&D &D in 1978, which would have made me 11 years old. So uh, in sixth grade, um, and a friend of mine taught me how to play. Uh, and in so doing, earned himself the uh, the teaching merit badge in Boy Scouts, <laughs> uh, which requires that you teach someone a complex skill. And the uh, scout master determined that that was complex enough to count. Uh, as soon as he got a look at what we were doing. Uh, so I've been playing since then continuously um, and I've been dungeon mastering the same campaign continuously since 1988. Well, that um, is an incredible achievement. Yeah, with some of the same players today and some of them are bringing their kids to the table. So it's you know become a multi-generational situation. We were going to talk about the OGO, but let's just talk about your home campaign all show long. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's you know when you go through all those edition changes you got to come up with campaign reasons for that so you know we've got cataclysms that happened there was one edition change that happened while they were moving across a magical lake and they went through this mist and came out the other side and they were changed so everyone had to convert their characters Ooh. from second to third edition at that point and uh, you know so there was each time there was a new edition i came up with another thing oh there's, there's a cataclysm that broke magic and so now magic works totally differently now and uh you know it was it was a lot of fun and uh it was one of those things where we've gone from one to 20 multiple times and so as each time as each party reaches 20 we retire that set of characters advance the clock and then the next set of characters begins with those characters as historical figures so he's been playing DD actually longer than i've been playing D, and that's impressive uh so let's hear a little bit about his position and who he reports to so what was your role at wizards before you became the executive director uh, so I've been there for two years, and when I first showed up, I was a director of operations for the larger studio that included Dungeons and Dragons as part of that larger mm -hmm. group. Uh, and then after the first year, I focused on the operations for D&D specifically. Um, and then a few months ago, I became the executive producer, which means running the the game team. And mm -hmm. I see that as basically my job is to make it so the creators can create, get them the resources they need, make sure we've got a roadmap that we can all shoot for, um, you know, make it possible for the fun to happen and then get out of their way. How, who do you report to as executive director of the D&D team? Uh, yeah, uh, so executive producer, just for clarity. Producer. Um, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I report to Dan Rawson, who is the uh, recently hired senior vice president of Dungeons & Dragons. So he leads all of Dungeons & Dragons. So he leads the digital teams, D&D you know, &D Beyond, and uh, the, 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 the digital play space, um, as well as uh, other uh, other support groups for D&D, &D and, and also the D&D &D game studio, which is what I lead. And then he reports directly to uh, Cynthia Williams. So it goes from me to Dan to Cynthia. And do you get to meet with the C-level as well or? Yeah, yeah. Um, multiple times a week, typically. Um, you right. know, we have one or two fixed meetings that we have for various topics. And then, of course, when things come up, I get called in. <laughs> and do you feel that you hear enough about what Hasbro and Wizards are planning at the corporate level um, and that they hear what your team is doing and needs? I definitely hear from my end, um, my contacts, my level of contact with uh, Hasbro is, you know, each each level up, I talk to fewer and fewer times, right? Mm -hmm. I talk to Dan every day. I talk to Cynthia a couple times a week. I talk to Hasbro sometimes, you know, once or twice a month. Um, and th now that being said, I do have some sort of peer level contacts at Hasbro mm -hmm. that I talk to from time to time. So I have just sort of personal relationships that uh, help improve communications as well. Uh, Hasbro strategy is pretty clear to me. That gets communicated to me on a, on a frequency that is that keeps me up to speed on what the goals are, strategically speaking. That being said, Hasbro doesn't get down to the... They're not very directive in terms of what they want D&D to do. There's, hey, we would like D&D to you know, uh, be this big by this time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the end of it. And then it's up to me to figure out how D&D becomes that big by that time. So that's what Kyle Brink does for Wizards of the Coast and his history with D&D. Now let's get into some of the information that we have received online and his response to it. We're going to begin with the idea of the walled garden and a new OGL for 1D&D. Wizards has previously stated that there will be an updated SRD for 1D&D. &D. Uh, can you confirm whether or not Wizards is committed to providing an open gaming license for 1D&D? &D? The SRD will remain compatible with all the stuff we publish, including the new rule set. Okay, so basically there won't be a new... OGL, it'll just be updated. What what we currently have will be updated to reflect the the newer version. That's right. That's right. Okay. And so there'll be like you know an SRD you know five point two, five point three, five point four, whatever. Each of which will be in Creative Commons and under the OGL. And we're definitely going to update be updating the SRD. Uh, our commitment is that the SRD will continue to be compatible with the rules updates that are coming. Now whether that's because we're going to bring rules in, um, you know, actual like just wholesale bring text in from the new rules or whether we use some kind of bridging language. The example I always give is, well, it's species over here and race over here. So any place you see species, you should understand, understand that to mean race. So if I'm playing a, you know, a, an OGL based or 5.1 SRD based uh, piece of content over here, and I've also bought the, the rules updates, I won't be confused. They'll work together still. And so that's, that's our promise is that the, the SRD will be updated to remain compatible with the new rules update. So that's for sure, whether it's 5.2, 5.3, whatever we call it. Um, so, you know, the new rules updates are still 5th edition. It's just going to be improvements to 5th edition, the way we see will, it. Will you also add the 3.5 SRD to it? And this isn't so much about the OGL controversy, but a lot of us have been wondering, what is going to happen with previous editions? Can we expect any of their information to end up under Creative Commons? 
We're doing, we're looking at it. Um, I think the answer is yes, with a small asterisk. And that asterisk is we need to do our homework because sure. we haven't looked closely at the, at the three, five SRD in some time. And speaking to the point now of our strategy being that blend of, of, uh, community and uh, trademark and copyright, we need to make sure that we don't give up some of that copyright or trademark protection by releasing the wrong thing into Creative Commons. So subject to us doing our homework and reading through the SRD and making sure we, there isn't something in there that shouldn't be in there, yes. Um, my my personal goal is as much as possible, I want to just move it into Creative Commons as is. I don't want to have to edit it, but I also got to be responsible. So we'll take a look. Is it so? And to that point, just to touch on the the previous SRDs, I know obviously one of the big ones that was out there was the third edition one. Is there plans to possibly go further back, or even touch on fourth, possibly if people are still looking to to do things like that? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, other than the work involved, sure. I mean, you know, it's it's all like uh, got to look at it, figure out what's the appropriate thing to to put into an SRD uh, for editions that. Um, that may not already be in SRDs. We'll have to create SRDs for them, which is a fairly uh, extensive process. And some, honestly, some of those old editions, wow, the files are... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> it might just be a logistical problem. It's not a, uh, it's not a strategic problem. It, it, so anything that would hold us up would be more logistical than strategic. So in other words, if you're looking for a 3.5 SRD under Creative Commons, you're probably going to get one, and it doesn't sound like it'd be that far off. As for other editions, maybe, and who knows when that would occur, but they're not necessarily opposed to it. It's a matter of just getting the work done to do it. But this does lead us a little bit into another question, and that's about 1D&D, because uh, he basically says that, you know, a lot of the 5.1 SRD can remain as is, and will either move in blocks of text or bridging language to have it work with 1D&D, which suggests more of a 5.5 than 6th edition. Uh, and it leads me to wonder about how does he look at the future of D&D in terms of editions? And he does give an answer here that I thought was fairly interesting. And do you think 1D&D can really be the final edition of D&D? I would like for D&D to be a living game. Um, and to me, a living game is one where People's experience of it can be continuous across generations, but it can also evolve with the player base. So if I played D&D 20 years ago and I play D&D today, I should, it should feel like at some level it's the same game, but also it should be a different game than it was 20 years ago. And 20 years from now, it should be a different game than it is today, but it should also be familiar to people who play it today. And so it, it, that's what I mean by a living game. It's still the same game in that you're not lost. You don't know. You don't wonder where it's gone. Where's my game gone? And at the same time, it is the game of its generation. And since we're on the subject of 1D&D, when do we get started again? We're still committed to our timeline. Uh, we're, we're, you know, this is, a, this is important to do. Um, it's our number one priority. Uh, I will say that the playtest timeline has been a bit in, impacted by the OGL sure. uh, situation. It seems like people are interested in getting back to the game now. The, the smoke is a little bit clearing on that. So we're going to get back to the playtest here real soon. Um, and we'll get back on track and, and continue down the road. Um, and everybody will see what, what's coming up because you'll see it in the playtest. He's also going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the survey responses and how surveys are used. Uh, so we got a little bit of this information from Jeremy Crawford. But we get a little bit more insight here as to how they perceive survey responses that I thought was good context. I mean, the we do have a pretty professional research team that gathers this information. And I think that um, there's always a difference between reviewers and the audience. Like if you look at Rotten Tomatoes, you know, you know or mm -hmm. you know, any, any situation where you're looking at the difference between professional reviewers and the audience, there's going to be a gap there. The audience will think one thing and the reviewers will think another thing. So the, the fact of that gap existing doesn't say to me that you have bad research. What it means is you need to understand what your research is actually telling you. Um, and so if the research is telling me that the player base likes these concepts, likes these mechanics in the limited window in which they've been able to play with them at their tables, that's useful information, that's valuable information. And also these mechanics need to stand the test of time. They need to be good in the long haul. They need to continue to make the game better each time. And that may be different 
than what you're getting from the immediate um, playtest feedback. So I think, that, and, and, and we have, of course, professional designers on our own teams um, who also give us pretty robust feedback. Uh, we have internal playtest teams and um, that feedback is probably closer to what you might get from a professional reviewer because we're pretty vigorous in our assessments of each other's work. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to switch gears from one D&D and talk a little bit about D&D Beyond. Uh, so one of the questions that's been coming up lately is, why are communications from Wizards of the Coast coming through D&D Beyond now instead of their original website? So we bought D&D Beyond, as you, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was a fairly pricey purchase. Uh, and so we intend to get the value out of that purchase, not to put too fine a point on it. Uh, and so D&D Beyond is the front door to D&D on the web. Um, and it's going to become even more so. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't see any difference between D&D Beyond and D&D. D&D Beyond is the D&D website. I think more and more you're going to see what had been the D&D website become less and less active um, and, and ultimately one day, you know, be largely a redirect over to D&D Beyond because D&D Beyond is the home of D&D. Since that's where everybody goes for their character sheets and their content mm -hmm. and stuff anyway, we're just accepting reality and saying, yes, this is where people go. So this is where we should be. Uh, and so just rather than operate two websites, we're going to operate one and it's going to be D&D Beyond. So what he's saying is that basically the old D&D website is they're basically abandoning it and they're just going to use the one website they have of D&D Beyond for everything. Now, I saw this reacted to online with this being confirmation that they were going to stop printing books. Uh, however, he was asked specifically about the printing of books, so that leads us to our next clip. Oh, a lot of people enjoy playing D&D with analog systems like pencil and paper, printed and printed books, stuff like that. Uh, do you think those players have a place in D&D's future, or do you think that there's sort of a shift to digital that's happening? We're adding, uh, adding play options, not taking away. However you want to play is great. If you want to buy books and play, if you want to buy dice and play, great, do that. If you want to play on D&D Beyond, great. If you want to play on a VTT, if you want to play in a virtual play space, awesome. If we want to like look way ahead, if people stop buying something, then we'll stop making it. But it's not our, it's not in our interest to make somebody stop buying something. There's also been questions that have come up regarding D&D Beyond and what kind of influence they'll have on future products. So let's hear him talk about that. A new product is being devised and. Um, Someone at D&D Beyond says, well, I'd like the product to work this way so that it can highlight what we offer. And somebody on the D&D studio side is saying, well, actually, you know, we think it should go this way because that's sort of the natural fit for the product. And, and, and so who makes those decisions if something like that comes up? And if I'm going to say, well, actually, I'm going to push up my glass. Well, actually, um, uh, the way that it works is the D&D the game studio is the center for the game content. So the D&D game studio produces all of the rules, all of the content that goes with the rules, all of those things that you think of as D&D. And D&D Beyond does a great job uh, turning that into a play service that people use while playing the game. So they've done a great job on their on the character sheet. Um, and uh, that team also does a great job bringing our books to life and hooking them into the character sheet. So in a way, it's uh, similar to how the D&D studio team right now also produces books. We produce what goes in the books and we produce the books themselves. And then over here, we have D&D Beyond, which produces, if you like, a different kind of book, a digital book, um, but it's still the same content. And so I think more and more, that's what it's going to look like is we're going to have this uh, a content group and maybe a book team and a D&D Beyond team and a digital play space team who express that content in the ways appropriate to their audience. So in that space, the D&D Beyond product managers have a lot of control over how they choose to express that D&D content because they're the ones who know their audience, they're the ones who know that platform, they're the ones who know best what D&D Beyond should look like. Where it comes into actually how the content is designed or what the content says, that's largely owned by the studio. However, you know, we're sister teams, so we keep in touch. Mm -hmm. And so communication flows both ways on that. Now, this leads us into talking about the virtual tabletop, because of course we were told that there were going to be paywalls in the virtual tabletop and that we would be using microtransactions to access the various content we needed to play. So I know there are a lot of concerns just in general based on the world that we live in about a shift to digital coming with a lot of microtransactions and things like that. Is that a valid concern to have over, for example, D&D Beyond or the, the official virtual tabletop? If we're doing our jobs right, the microtransactions will just be smaller versions of cool stuff you want to buy. I could use a nickel to represent my character, or I could buy a figure, or I could buy paints to paint my figure. Absolutely, you'll be able to play, and it'll be a, a, a great play experience. And if you want it to be cooler, there will be options where you can 
have your experience be cooler. It'll never be required, though. It'll always be optional stuff. Now, one of the concerns raised is that their new virtual tabletop would just be for like playing their published adventures and it would just be their content. It's nothing that we could use to create our own campaigns or anything like that. So let's hear him talk about that. So yeah. uh, folks have been asking, with the one D&D virtual tabletop, whenever it, is there any plans to allow folks to create within it as in uh, almost treat it like a like a steam style setup where people can create in it so that people can go and pick up stuff that way as opposed to you know either it being first party or not at all oh yeah we definitely want to have creator tools in there um, we're very interested in uh, the the user generated content possibilities there uh, for people to be able to create stuff in that space uh, we're still working out exactly how that will play out but that is one of the pillars of our approach is because D and D is fundamentally a creative activity, everybody who plays D and D is a creator. From the moment you invent a character and start putting a funny voice to it, you're a creator. Um, and then, you know, a lot of some of us become DMs, and we create more stuff, and we create more stuff. And and I, uh, it's it's so fundamental to the nature of the game that we've always intended for people to be able to create within that tool. I can't speak to the exact structure, but the short answer is it will not be first party only. So very recently, uh, there have been bundles that you can buy for D&D books that provide you a physical book as well as access on D&D Beyond. One of the concerns of this is that if you want to go to a local bookstore and buy your book, then you're not going to have access to the D&D Beyond content or that won't even be an option for you unless you buy it separately. So Kyle Brink has asked, what was the Coast plans to do to support the local brick and mortar stores? That's a, that's a big priority for us. And the, the key is something that works. Uh, a lot of the immediate ideas have some logistical problems or some security problems. Like, hey, what if you just put a code in a book? Well, someone will just so open the book and code. take a photo with their phone. And, yeah, or whatever. Uh, what if we, you know, put cards at the register? Well, people can just grab those cards if, no, if nobody's looking, right? Like, so okay, how do we do this in a way, um, you know, do we do an affiliate program or something where you know, the store sends people to D&D Beyond and they get something for that? I don't know. But it is very important to us to have the physical and digital purchases be connected and to support local game stores. Those things are both true. And we're working on how to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, suggestion box suggestion box is open. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we want to do that successfully. Um, just thinking about all the the various um, logistics of it is what's been making it hard to land on a final solution. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to a good answer for that. And let's hear him talk a little about the future of Adventures League. As I mentioned earlier, my view of D&D is that it, it should be accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And what that means is helping everyone understand and enjoy the game, which means somehow having your first game. Um, somehow finding a group of people in a DM to play D&D for the first time. And a lot of organized play provides that opportunity for people. Um, it also provides play groups for people who just don't have a regular play group, sure. but are familiar with the game, but also, um, you know, for people needing their first play experience. And that's essential. If we are going to go, go to the world the way I want to go to the world, we need to have a much better first play experience for people. And in my view, there's some. There's a lot more we can do with what we currently call organized play to provide that kind of experience. Um, and to, so I think we need to be looking closely at how we do that. How is that structured? You know, if the, for example, if the optimum way to play is with D and D Beyond on a tablet, but the optimum place to play the first time is the local game store. Well, that gets back to our earlier conversation about how do local game stores participate in the digital right. thing. So we need to answer that question. Um, so it's. Um, there will definitely be some form of organized play, whether it will literally be today's Adventurers League or not. I mean, mm. I think I can definitively, definitively say it won't be today's Adventurers League unchanged. Right. Um, I do believe that we need a more accessible form of organized play so that more people come into the game um, more easily. Now, one thing we have been told is that the reason Wizards of the Coast changed directions on OGL 1.1 and the only reason they did is because it was leaked, the D&D community found out, they got angry, they spoke out, they cancelled D&D Beyond subscriptions, and therefore Wizards of the Coast was forced to make changes to OGL 1.1. Let's hear what Kyle Brink has to say about that. By the time um, the 1.1 uh, uh, version of the document was made public, we had already abandoned a lot of the things that were problematic because of the feedback we were getting. We just hadn't published that update yet, so nobody could see it. So Kyle Brink has asked a follow-up question here. If they were already planning changes at the time OGL 1.1 was leaked, 
then why was it right after people started canceling D&D Beyond subscriptions, suddenly, boom, we've got OGL 1.2? Uh, because it takes a long time to actually modify a legal document when you have a lot of stakeholders. It, you can't turn on a dime. And so it can't, it actually couldn't have been turned around in response to the decline in subscriptions because that would have been too fast. It would have been too short a time period for a corporation our size to pull that off with a legal document with a bunch of stakeholders. Um, and so we were already working on that document before the, uh, uh, the um, uh, folks who decided to stop uh, subscribing decided to stop doing that. And then he will talk about why, after OGL 1.1 was leaked, D&D Beyond subscriptions are being cancelled, why isn't Wizards of the Coast just going public and saying, hey, we're working on OGL 1.2, it's going to have positive changes, just give us a little bit of time. However, in that environment where there was already such a lack of trust and already such concern over our motives, every word we knew would be scrutinized and could be radioactive, and there was honestly a fear of making it worse. Honestly, a fear of saying the wrong thing and throwing gas on the fire. I mean, it was bad. Um, mm. You're kind of, you know, we, we felt like we were screwed if we spoke and we were screwed if we were silent. And so we figured the best thing we could do is just deliver here, mm -hmm. give you a thing that was better. Um, and in hindsight, obviously, that wasn't the right decision. But that's that was the mindset at the time was we needed to simply show you what we meant by giving you something better. Um, rather than try to say, oh, we're working on it, because we felt like in that environment, that was as likely to make it worse as better. And if that's the case, then how in the world did we get they won and so did we? I uh, I honestly don't know. Um, everything I signed, by the way, I wrote. So if my name's mm -hmm. on it, I typed the words. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't take input while I was typing, but every word, if I put my name on it, I wrote it. Um, and I honestly don't know who contributed to the unsigned statement before I started posting. The thing that I was working on was the deliverable 1.2, the actual thing, um, mm -hmm. and the process for how we were going to move forward from this and you know, bringing the, the feedback process and the playtest process to the table to get the community involved as soon as possible. That was what I was working on uh, for all this. I, 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 the, the statement that came out on the Friday, um, it, I read it around the same time you did. So the question as to who wrote that, we do not have an answer. Uh, so according to Kyle Brink, it wasn't him, it wasn't a member of his team, but it must have been somebody else within the organization. Whether it came from legal, don't know. Uh, so we have not gotten an answer to that. So of all these interviews, uh, the one question that was of most interest to me was one thing that I had gotten just so very wrong, and I was wondering why I had gotten it so wrong, because uh, I had predicted that Wizard of the Coast couldn't back down on the OGL 1.0a, and other members of the YouTube community, whether they agreed with me on things regarding the OGL or not, that was one thing we all agreed on, is that Wizards wouldn't back down. But as we know, they did. And thank you to Teos and Mastering Dungeons for actually asking how they came to that decision. So Wizards asked for a survey after 1.2, and I greatly appreciate that because it, it really demonstrated that we were being listened to and it was made super clear when then all of the, the plug was pulled on the changes, no deauthorizing the, the OGL, SRD 5.1 placed in Creative Commons. Um, how was it that that really came to happen that, that someone said, let's go all the way to this place? So we, so when I mean it happened more or less as I wrote it. I mean it, everything that I it's got my name on it I wrote and I meant. Mm -hmm. So all those mm -hmm. all those letters came out of my keyboard, uh, and uh, the it was you know, we were watching the survey results come in and we could see what people were saying and we could see where this survey feedback was coming from and the range of people is coming from people who are current creators, people who are up and coming creators, people who are not yet creators but really used a lot of third party content. So there was quite a range of, of people. I mean, 15,000 responses, that's yeah. that's a bunch of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the intent was always to run it the way we do our, our play test uh, cycles for our, our game content, which is collect a bunch of feedback, analyze it, process it, you know, uh, sort it, because you, know, you can't read 15,000 entries or you'll be there all week just reading it. Um, and so, but we do have a method for getting that information digestible. Um, and it became super clear where it was going to the point where 
I said, it's obvious where this is going, right? And we already know, at this point, we had already discussed, look, we already thought about Creative Commons in 1.2. What about just, let's just go all Creative Commons. And so we were already talking about that as the survey feedback was coming in. And when we saw the survey feedback also supporting Creative Commons, said, look, it's not just us, not just us the community likes this too. I don't know why we're waiting. Like, why do we need to wait another 10 days to do any, let's just do it now. Um, Cause it's super obvious. Let's, you know, let's not drag this out. So yeah, so, there were a few of us who were pushing for urgency on that one. Cause it was, it was stupid obvious. I'm, I'm very glad it happened. Uh, I mean, you, you <laughs> say that, but I've, I've worked with a lot of companies over the years that have not made those kinds of moves and when, when they could have. So I, I'm appreciative of that. I know a lot of people are. So if Kyle Brink has been honest in these interviews, and if he hasn't, I think we'll get confirmation of that soon enough. I mean, if 1D&D has a restrictive game license, we'll know. If the VTT has a bunch of paywalls, we'll know. If third-party publishers produce emails where they were told to sign the OGL 1.1, we'll know. And Kyle Brink will be held accountable for what he has said in these interviews. So let's say he's been honest. Well, then a lot of speculation on social media since the start of this mess has been wrong. Third-party publishers weren't being forced to sign OGL 1.1. Instead, they were asked for feedback, which was being taken and listened to, and changes were being made in response. However, the OGL 1.1 was sent to third-party creators, and it was an unfair contract. And even if creators were asked for feedback, seeing an unfair contract like that as the opening position had to be terrifying. Kyle Brink says there were lots of stakeholders at the table when it was drafted, and it sounds like the voice of the D&D studio people were not listened to enough, leading to this unfair deal that got sent out, and let's face it, if the OGL draft that had been sent to creators had been a contract that they were comfortable with, this whole mess would never have happened. Which leads to the big question, can we expect something like this to happen again in the future? Have there been any changes in leadership or in the decision-making processes because people are worried that, again, to your point, if you change or other people in the in the you know upper management or wherever end up changing, yeah. what's to stop us from being where we are again? Yeah, I mean, well, the number one thing that will stop us from being where we are again is the Creative Commons movement. Sure. It just takes the OGL. The, so that particular mistake is no longer possible. Correct. Because it's just not even there. Now, will are, are other strategic mistakes possible? Yes, of course. Uh, and so the main thing that's changed in all this is um, the game team is now much closer to senior leadership than it was. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a trial by fire thing, but um, uh, we've gotten a lot closer to the senior executives through all this as we all work together to uh, get to the right answer on all this. It's, it's done a lot to build instant trust. Keeping in mind that um, Cynthia Williams joined us last year, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Rawson joined us late last year, um, and they're the the top two you know mm -hmm. executives for D and D in, in Wizards of the Coast. So they've barely got their feet under them in terms of uh, executive tenure. And so we're we've just now through this forged a, a much closer trust relationship with them. And uh, I feel very listened to at this point by them. Um, you know the the speed with which everybody turned and supported whatever we asked for. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think people saw, you know, when, when you started seeing my posts and things started moving sure. real fast, the organization really turned on a dime to support us. Um, and so I feel like that kind of working relationship is what's going to protect us from, from something like this again. Now, based on what I've heard from Kyle Brink, my view is there's been a lot of bad communication, bad communication within Wizards of the Coast. Bad communication with third-party publishers. Bad communication with the community. And maybe that played a bigger part in this whole debacle than actual bad intentions. So we have had a rough couple months. But based on what Wizards of the Coast ended up demonstrating with their actions, as well as commitments here to 1D&D &D moving forward, as well as apparently positive changes in the internal workings of Wizards of the Coast and empowerment given to the D&D game team, I think there is a silver lining. In this last brief clip, I'll let Kyle Brink speak to that. I like where we landed. I love where we landed. I do not like it all how we got here. And I think I'll leave it at that. I too like where we landed, and I do not like at all how we got here. 